Hello, it's Philip Taylor speaking from Richmond Green Chambers in London. Today I'm looking at a book which has come to us from Edward Elgar Publishing. It's another book in their series about Chinese law and its relationship with the rest of the world. This one is Conflict of Laws in the People's Republic of China. It's been written by three people and I start off by apologising profusely for my appalling pronunciation. But the three people are Zheng Sophia Tang, Yong Ping Zhao and Zhenzing Hyo. Now I hope I've pronounced them correctly, if not apologies in advance. This is an excellent book, it's available electronically under the Elgar online service and it's part of the Elgar Asian Commercial Law and Practice series. Um, as I say, it's available um, for you and you can look at it online and it's also of course available as an e-book. Now Elizabeth and I talked about the review because this is a very interesting book and it's an area which a lot of people have not that much information about. So um, in many ways they're groundbreaking because we're getting, getting a lot of information about Chinese law and its relationship with anything else. Now for our book review title for the review we've, we've given it a thorough analysis of conflict of laws issues in China also available as an e-book and that's really our title for the book. Let's look at it first of all. Nice red cover there. It's a hardback and it's a heavy book actually. Nice uh, nice cover. There is the spine and then on the back there's a quote and some detail, a little bit of detail about the book. The quote is at the top and then you've got the information uh, further down. Now let me go to the back of the book. It runs to some 440 odd pages. Uh, what you have got is paragraph numbering in the index for reference purposes. Not page number, it's paragraph numbering uh, information. Now what you have got after that, there is the start of the index. Now what you've got after that, I don't speak Chinese, either of the varieties. Um, now it, this is the bibliography, you'll see it's in English and of course it's also uh, got quite a lot of useful information and I'm sure that the way it is structured the bibliography is, is quite a substantial one. It's got the English materials and then it follows through with the Chinese materials thereafter at, at the back and it's quite a substantial section. You can see even from the last chapter, chapter 14, it's paragraph numbering with footnotes and there's a nice conclusion uh, to, to many of the chapters to assist you with understanding what is going on. This is the uh, series of a uh, Elgar Asian Commercial Law and Practice uh, publications and then that's the main front page there. And you've also got in addition to that uh, details about the online side and then you've got the, the content section split into various parts and chapter headings. In fact it's got five parts, 14 chapters and uh, then the bibliography and index. And then you've got an extended table of contents. Again, I think that is, makes it much more easy for one to navigate the book and try to understand. The typeface is slightly different from what you might be familiar with. I found it slightly different from what I normally, normally uh, use, but you can see there the structure of the book itself. And then there's the preface and then acknowledgements to go with the preface. And then you've got, after those are the three editors there, then you've got the abbreviations, and then you've got the tables of cases. And you can see how it's structured. Um, obviously, I'm coming to this as an English language speaker, but you've got, this is the um, People's Republic of China Supreme uh, People's Court cases. And that's the list of them there. And you can see how they are listed. And then after that, you can see it runs all the way through. Then you've got other jurisdictions covered as well, bearing in mind that this is about conflict of laws. Then you've got tables of legislation uh, there. Uh, and then again, running all the way through. Um, quite a large amount of information there. Then we get to the, again, right at the back, you've got national legislation from individual countries, including the UK and the US. Then here is part one, and then you can see we get into we launch into it. There's a nice little index for each chapter, short index, which tells you what's in it. And then, as I say, you've got the actual footnotes at the bottom, and you will see that the paragraph numbering is at the sides, um, that side, and then that side. So you should be able to find things pretty quickly. It's a heavy book as well. Nice pub, uh, nice paper. 
you print it on nice paper and then for most of the chapters you've got a conclusion in each of the chapters right there's the book now what do we say about it well Elizabeth and I thought about this book because we've reviewed a number of books now from um, Elgar in this area it's an important area and I think from everybody's point of view it's important for us to know what is happening and this is what we say anyway until fairly recently there had been something of a shortage of literature on Chinese law accessible to English speaking readers a situation which the three authors of this book have sought to redress and they've done so with considerable success via the publication of this excellent international law book. It's a new title from Edward Elgar and the title provides invaluable assistance to Western lawyers, particularly those specialising in commercial and civil law who seek both a broad-based and in-depth analysis uh, of the range of issues pertaining to conflict of laws in China. But I think it's important to know that the book deals with commercial and civil law only. A family law, of course, will be the subject of a separate book at a later stage. In producing this uh, monograph, the three expert authors have both stated and implied that Chinese law, as it now manifests itself, is a bit of a late developer, especially in the area of conflict of laws, which, of course, refers to the conflict that transpires, some transpires when the laws of one country differ from those of another. And that's why the conflict, of course, arises. Now, due to China's uh, startling rate of economic growth uh, since 1978, and also such catalysts as the handing over of Hong Kong, for example, in 1997 to, um, to the Chinese, it became uh, expedient for the Chinese conflict of laws system to modernise, and the um, writers say it is fair to argue that China has established a comprehensive and up-to-date system since the 2010s, and the Chinese conflict system now enters into the modernisation age. And I think you can see that there are very substantial changes taking place, and I'm sure they're going to continue, notwithstanding what is happening within Europe and the European Union with Britain's exit. The five sections of the um, book um, into which it's divided deal with a wide range of um, issues, including jurisdiction, choice of law, procedure, judgment, enforcement, and more besides, supported throughout by decisions on case law, judicial practice, and the body of relevant data and empirical evidence which is available. And the introductory chapter itself offers an historic uh, perspective which provides as succinct and informative account an account as you're likely to find anywhere in our view of the bumpy evolutionary road which led to the development of contemporary Chinese law. Now I'm well aware that a number of universities have looked at this area of law and I still think it's relatively unexplored even today uh, but it's certainly something that will be much to the fore, I think, in, in academic law schools in the future, certainly in the future of this century. Perhaps to oversimplify, basically the story, um, in terms of China, of a mighty nation suffering under the yoke of successive tyrannies and centuries of isolationism <coughs> perpetrated under various dynasties. Curiously, there appears to be no mention of the recent tyranny, if I can put it that way, of Mao Zedong, or his infamous Cultural Revolution, although the title of the volume containing his complete works is listed in the bibliography, and I'm not here to make any comment about Mao or anything else, but I think one has to identify that in fact a lot of what uh, he did whilst he was the leader does not appear to, to have much substance as far as this book is concerned. And I'm not making any criticisms of anybody just in case that may be perceived to be the case, it isn't. Um, nonetheless, let me just say that the, what I've just said, the book is nonetheless, as I say, an enlightening read from any number of viewpoints. I certainly found it important from the point of view of general information, which I'm sure a lot of other people would find helpful, if, even if they're in the business community and not lawyers, because it is an area we don't know that much about. 
it's historic accounts of the often uncertain evolution of Chinese law in general and the conflicts of law in particular are frankly quite fascinating and I'm sure anybody who's got a passing interest will find that uh, the case. Clearly it's a book for international lawyers and scholars with a special interest in Chinese law in which issues relating to conflict of laws assume an exceptionally prominent role. A massive bibliography, as I've indicated, some 40 pages. Uh, its detailed table of contents and the index is, in fact, uh, leading it to be a book, which is a valuable find for general readers involved with Chinese matters and researchers who will also appreciate the extensive tables of cases and of legislation. And as I've indicated, it's structured in a certain way, both for the Chinese and non-Chinese uh, markets to read. And as a recent addition to Elgar's Asian Law and Practice series, the book's publication date cited at 2016. And I'm recording this in the summer of 2016. There's the book front page again. You've got the spine and then you've got information at the back. Just opening it in the middle, um, I'm looking here. Grounds for refusal to enforcement of foreign arbitral awards. And you've got quite a lot of detailed information. The paragraph number, as I say, on both sides, some footnotes. There's a lot of detailed information. It looks at how um, one can present a case. Uh, it looks also at, at the sort of practice in terms of public policy, the sort of practices that are involved. Because like any jurisdiction, I don't do a lot of work myself internationally but what I have done every single time it's different you've got to know how people approach a particular problem but I have to say that as a general rule of thumb whatever the jurisdiction the same basic principles really do apply in terms of thinking out what the problem is and how you deal with it and what in fact the client wants so it doesn't matter what type of economic structure the country has or what political direction it's going in, you've still got those basic issues which are always there jurisprudentially. I'd like to thank the three authors, I'm not going to mention your names again, but thank you so much for producing this work and also to Elgar once again for producing work of such a high quality which is of great assistance to us as practitioners. I think this is for a general readership as well and of course it is at the higher end academically, so it will be of interest to scholars. Thank you to all concerned anyway for its production. Bye-bye.